My name is Kevin Good. I am the new uh, director of the ASO series. Um, so, welcome. Thanks for coming. Um, today, we have Mark Cross, um, who will be giving us a masterclass on commercial music. Um, he is an engineer, mixer, producer, and composer. Um, He's worked on a series of television shows as well as some movies, things you've probably heard of like Cars <laughs> from Pixar. Um, as you may know, this concert series is every Thursday at 1 p.m., such as now. Um, we will have a little bit of a break. Um, there is no instructional uh, day this coming Thursday, so there will be no concert, and then we're on spring break. So our next event after this will be um, April 13th, which will be a choral workshop, and then April 20th will be a showcase of music, theater, and dance. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mark Cross. How are you guys doing today? Great. Good. It's good to see you guys. I'm glad you were able to make it. I'm here today to talk to you about commercial music or commercial writing. Does anyone know what that is? I have some ideas. Yeah, what do you think? Uh, music production based on not necessarily like classical concepts, but more um, modern, maybe. OK, anyone else? Yeah. Composing. Within a digital audio workstation. Yeah, anyone else? A lot of it is about the business of writing music and getting paid for it. Uh, and so, in that regard, today's commercial music is usually centered around music for visual media. And so, that could be music for television shows, music for feature films. Uh, music on TikTok videos. Uh, and so there is music all around us in our everyday world. And it's sort of a rare occasion when we stop and think, well, I wonder where that music came from. You know, uh, that music in my TikTok video, where did that come from? Did, who, who wrote that? Uh, who got paid for that? And so those are some of the things I want to talk about today. I've got a few notes here because I just did. Uh, and so one of the things that uh, I experienced growing up was having a lot of those questions. Questions of, uh, of exactly that. Who wrote this? Or where is this music coming from? And it wasn't until I got to college that those questions started to get answered. And what was really interesting to me is that the answers were often hidden, as they say, in plain sight. Uh, in other words, I quickly found that the TV shows that I was watching, the films that I'd like to go to the theater and see, all had music in them, of course. But I never thought, well, someone had to compose that music. Someone had to produce that music. Somebody had to orchestrate that music arrange, record, mix, edit. Sometimes there was music supervision involved. And so it was at that point that I thought, aha, there's some opportunity here. And so that is what led me out here to Los Angeles to start working in the entertainment industry. And in doing that, uh, I found myself uh, looking to a lot of the classes that I was taking to sort of prepare myself for that. So classes like music technology, music theory, uh, commercial writing, I knew that that would all really uh, create a foundation in which I could use that in getting things started out here. And I was very lucky. I think I, I got a job working at a studio probably within the first week that I was here. Um, and it was a post-production studio. Does anyone know what post-production is? Yeah. Like when the film is wrapped up in terms of cinematography, then it goes along to uh, some, some supplemental things like adding the score, and the music composer, like, hey, the composer says, oh, I think we're going to see this song. I, I can compose this or something like that. 
Yes, like adding music to to the project. Uh, anyone else? Post production? Yeah. It's the editing process after everything has been uh, pretty much finished. Just adding final touches to uh, the production. Yeah. Anyone else? These are all good. It's editing and it's music, but it's also dialogue and sound effects. And uh, let's see if this, this is it. Oh, it is. It is on. Uh, and so one of the things that they did at the studio was dealing with dialogue replacement. This was kind of interesting because uh, I didn't realize that uh, every TV show and every film had some sort of dialogue replacement. When you're filming a scene, of course, people make mistakes. You might get a really great performance, but someone might accidentally kick over a prop while they're talking, or maybe a plane flies overhead. And so in that instance, they would bring these actors in, let's see if I have this queued up, into a studio like this, where they would see the scene that they filmed, and then they would redo the dialogue and mimic their performance. And so that was kind of interesting. And also in post-production, they deal with sound effects. Oftentimes when we see these big Hollywood productions of uh, maybe this grand ballroom with this big checkered marble floor, we think, wow, that is awesome. But when you get to the harsh light of reality, that big checkered ballroom is actually on plywood. <laughs> and when the actors dance across it or walk across it, it doesn't sound like marble. So they bring people in to act out those sound effects to make it sound a little bit more realistic. And so often this was called Foley sound effects or any kind of acted out sound effects. And uh, that was done on a Foley stage. And I quickly found that a Foley stage, a good Foley stage, often looked like a garage that hadn't been cleaned out in 20 years. Because <laughs> uh, that meant that they had all kinds of props and all kinds of shoes and all kinds of different surfaces that they could walk upon. Uh, a, a good friend of mine is a Foley editor. He, he uh, asked me to come by and see him one day, and I got there early just to see it in action. And it was really funny because they were doing uh, Foley for a, a movie with Jennifer Aniston. And so here is this you know, a scene with her in this beautiful dress wearing pumps. And she uh, you know, walks up to her front door. She walks outside. She picks up the morning paper. She walks along the sidewalk walks onto her grass for a second, and then gets in the car and drives away. And so then what they had was the Foley actor, this dude who put on pumps and found the surface that she was walking on and watched Jennifer walking on the concrete, Jennifer walking on the grass, Jennifer pausing, Jennifer getting into the car, done. And so they did a lot of Foley effects and sound effects as well, but also, we did score. And this is when, getting back to what you guys were talking about, is commercial music, when someone wrote music for a scene, and when that music was written and orchestrated, it was ready to record. And so they would set up a studio with a variety of different microphones, bringing in the orchestra to play, to conduct, and this is where they would record the soundtrack, which was pretty awesome. And then in post-production, so post-production is dialogue, it's music, and it's sound effects. And then they also had what's called re-recording mixing. It's kind of an interesting term, which goes back to the 1920s, 1930s, back to like Wizard of Oz, where a studio had said, hey, we've got all of our dialogue recorded, we've got all of our music recorded, we have all of our sound effects recorded, we need somebody to just get in here and re-record it all together. Well, today we call that mixing, right? But that, that, uh, that term has stayed, and so that all comes together on a dub stage. And this is a theater-like environment where you have this massive mixing console, and on one section you have all the dialogue, on another section you have all the sound effects, and of course on another section you have all the music. And so this was all happening at the studio that I was working in. And like most people, I started out entry level. I started out as a PA, which is a, an acronym for a production assistant. Typical entry level position. And I was involved in all of this stuff. And the real cool aspect of starting out entry level is that it gives you a real grand view of the industry without too much responsibility. And you also have the opportunity to kind of find out where you fit in. And I found that I fit in pretty much 
with these guys. I really enjoyed recording the orchestras, recording the soundtrack, the scores, the songs for the film. I really, uh, really came to, uh, to like that. It was a lot of fun. Uh, here's another picture of, uh, of uh, a dub stage. And so fortunately for me, I was able to evolve from a PA into an engineer, then into a mixer, and then that evolved into production because I was familiar with the whole process. And so the first movie that I got involved with producing the score and the songs for was Beavis and Butthead Do America. And it was kind of funny, and we all kind of giggle when we see this, but to everyone's sort of shock and surprise, it was a big success. It made $60 million in its first weekend. And Paramount was like, what? And then it just continued to make money, which was great. And so that led to producing scores for other movies like uh, Meet the Parents, where I got to work with Randy Newman, Alien Resurrection, where I got to work with John Frizzell, back with Randy Newman again for Cars, and then that led me to also working in television on the show ER for the last 10 seasons that it was on, which was a lot of fun. Uh, and so in doing that, I was very fortunate to work with these amazing composers, and it was very inspiring, as you can imagine. And so I thought, wow, if I've evolved from a PA to an engineer to a mixer to a producer, I know how to write, maybe I should try my hand at composing. And so I got to work on music on a lot of these projects. And so what I want to share with you now actually is uh, something uh, that I worked on with uh, my friend Marty Davich on the show ER. And one thing that I learned quickly in commercial writing is now I'm not just writing music for it to be happy or for it to be sad or to be dramatic. Of course, those are things that need to be addressed. But now you have to really read the scene. I'm not really a composer now. I'm actually a storyteller through music. And so it was very important to the directors and to the executive producers that the musical storytelling was just as important as the dialogue and the sound effects. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about this, uh, this clip that I'm going to show you. This is a clip from the TV show ER. And if you're not familiar with this, this is a show about uh, in a uh, hospital. And in this instance, we have a first year doctor and very confident kid, and he just loses his first patient. And the people around him, his supervisor, his colleagues are like, look, this thing, this happens. It's no fault, you know, people die, you know, and so, you know, don't worry about it, these things happen. But this guy's taking it really, really hard. He's never lost a patient before, and so now he is left alone in the room with the nurse and the patient and these thoughts that are going through his head. And so that said, I'm going to try and seamlessly transition here, over here. So, and by the way, this music was written using, a, someone talked about a digital audio workstation. This is a digital audio workstation called Logic Pro. Uh, and so here you can see on the lower right hand side is the scene with the actors. Uh, then you can see these different tracks that are up. Uh, there's piano and strings and synthesizers and stuff. And you should hear the dialogue as well. And so now that you know a little bit about this, hopefully it will make a little bit more sense as we play. Pull the curtain behind you. to another scene that has nothing to do with it uh, to keep the action going and the pacing and of course the music would change there as well uh, and so here is an opportunity to try and help tell the story and everything that's going on in the psychological subtext of the character uh, and so using this technology uh, the digital audio workstation makes this very uh, not I don't want to say easy but it makes it a lot more efficient 
And one of the neat things about the music technology is uh, it's accessible to so many people now. I think we see a lot of, especially younger people that get on a, a laptop computer and maybe with GarageBand or FL Studio or even Logic Pro, they start playing around and, and putting music together. And what's interesting about this, one of the things I love is that we just heard that piano part. Uh, and so sometimes when we're playing around with the digital audio workstation, and I know this is my case, is I'm just kind of improvising. I'm looking at the picture and I'm just kind of trying to find the notes. And I think, oh, okay, that's cool. And I don't even think about what I played. But I'm not a keyboard player, I'm a guitar player. And so when at some point I'll usually get a piano player to come in and do what I just did. So the neat thing about this program is that it can then show me what the piano part looks like. And so, hold on a second as the, the view has changed a little bit. And so this can show me what I just played. And I can take this and I can go, okay, that's cool. And look, I, I actually I seem to be in the key of G minor. I see a B flat there. And, uh, and yeah, and I could then hit Command P and print this out as a part, and I could put that in front of you know a piano player, and they could play it with style and finesse, probably better than you know my interpretation of it, uh, which is really cool. And so using the MIDI to, or the music technology and and MIDI, I'm able to not only use this as sort of an empty canvas to paint my musical picture as I'm trying to do my musical storytelling, but it actually gives me the opportunity to print out sheet music or see what my ideas look like in traditional notation. So when I connect with a orchestra, if I'm writing for strings or with other musicians, I can put together parts for them very quickly and efficiently. This is awesome because uh, back to my days as a PA, I remember I worked with a composer named Carter Burwell. And I remember doing a session with him one time and we all took a lunch break and I had finished my sandwich and he said, hey, do you think you could write out this horn part for me? And I was like, oh yeah, sure. So he gave me notation paper and a pencil. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm writing this out. Of course, this was like 1980 something, 1989 or something. and so. Of course, that's what you did back then. Now, we can do it with technology, which is really great. And sometimes, especially as I found in teaching, is that sometimes people don't uh, are, are not really sure what they're playing. And so this is kind of a nice little realization to see, oh, look, this is what I just created. I had no idea. And so that's a neat aspect of music technology. Uh, I wanted to share a couple of other uh, scenes with you as well. Um, what I want to show, with, show you now is kind of an interesting thing that uh, I did on a show called Curb Your Enthusiasm. And if you're familiar with this show, the main character is this guy, Larry David, and he's always saying the wrong thing at the wrong time, getting people upset, getting people in, himself mainly in trouble. And so in this instance, he upset an opera singer, or a singer and an accordion player that are uh, actually like singing waiters at an Italian restaurant. He's trying to apologize, he's upset somebody else, and so they wanted to pre-record these musicians playing uh, the accordion and singing so that they could lay it into the TV show and make it sound really good. But then they got this idea, they said, oh yeah, and then Larry's gonna get chased by this guy and he's gonna run out. And once he runs out, we want the music to sound like a full orchestra. And we want it to sound like they're not singing at the Italian restaurant, now they're singing at Carnegie Hall. And you can do that, right, Mark? And I said, sure, we can do that. And so this was a lot of fun, a little bit challenging, as you can imagine. So uh, I'm going to play for you this, this excerpt from uh, the show. If I can get it happening here. It kind of starts a little bit in, right about here. So I'll make this full screen. And hey man, oh, I'm sorry that it took it so fast because it really, honestly, it really was a good game. 
Yes, absolutely. Now, come on. Just go sit, will you, please? Thanks. And so that was kind of fun uh, to do that. Uh, and again, it's post-production. Understanding the post-production made all the difference. When I was first asked to just go in the studio with the accordion player and the singer, uh, we thought we were just doing a pre-record or something that they could play back on the set. Because when they do this on the set, they have an accordion that actually makes no sound. And the singer is actually just sort of mimicking and not really singing. They're just playing this back and they're just mining it. And then they use the professional recording in the final dub, as you saw with the dub stage, to put it all together. And so adding all of the additional orchestration and production to make it sound like they're at a concert hall was a lot of fun to do exactly that. And then oftentimes, and I'll show you one other clip and then I'll kind of open this up for any questions that you might have, uh, is uh, in the same show, I was asked to put together a, a band as they were going to have a bar mitzvah. And in this situation, they wanted to have a live band playing as if you were at a bar mitzvah or a wedding. And normally in those situations, again, in pre-production, you would pre-record all of this stuff and they would hire really good looking actors that would put on guitars and just sort of look really nice and play and it would be great visually and then sonically they would just play back what the musicians did in the studio and everyone would watch it and no one hopefully would know the difference. Ironically in this instance they wanted to hire a live band and capture everything live which was awesome. And so they asked me to assemble a bunch of jazz musicians, which we did. And then they were kind of hesitant on their singer. They had asked me to audition some singers, and so I gave them two or three males, two or three females. We were just basically doing a jazz standard. And all the singers were awesome. Uh, but they said, no, 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 we want a star. And I said, whoever you want is fine with me. Let, just let me know. And at the last minute, they said, oh, we're going to bring in this guy, John Legend. And I thought, OK. I've heard of him, he's cool, great idea, right? And so, um, and John was amazing. Uh, we had reached out to him to see if the key of the song was okay, he never really responded, so we took technology with us, so in case we played it for him and he didn't like it in the key of E flat, we could always put it up into, say, like F or G, or maybe down into D or whatever. We were ready to do that at a moment's notice. And so I'll play you this, uh, this little uh, excerpt. There's a much younger me. Oh, you and I 
based on something uh, that, that my dad got me into when I was in high school, which was, he used to call it forward thinking. And uh, he would say, Mark, make yourself a five-year plan. Where are you gonna be in five years? And I was like, oh, dad, leave me alone. You know, <laughs> I wanna go out, right? He's like, no, 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 sit down for just a few minutes and let's write this out, you know, and let's make a 10-year plan. Where do you see yourself in 10 years? And of course, at that moment, I was pretty disinterested, but I did it and I realized that once I put this stuff on paper, that it became this foundation in my head. And this was the stuff that led me to study in college, prepare myself, and then take it further to do what I'm doing today. And so I found that to be really, really helpful. And I always encourage that as I've kind of moved into academia now, uh, doing some teaching uh, at Berkeley College of Music online and also at CSUN. And so um, I really encourage students to make those five-year plans, think in terms of how to prepare themselves if they're interested in doing this kind of thing. Uh, and like I said, when I was at that age, I didn't really understand that this even existed. Uh, it was very foreign to me, and I had a lot of questions, but I didn't have a whole lot of answers. And it wasn't until I took that step to really look into it that these kind of things revealed themselves. So I'm hoping that this was helpful and informative, and I'm wondering if any of you guys have any questions? Yeah. Um, it's a very specific question, but when you were showing us um, the sheet music that Logic created, yeah. I didn't know the time signature and like, how was it able to get the rhythm so perfectly? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, actually, when when I wrote this, it, uh, Logic defaults to 4-4, and this just happened to come out of me in 4-4. Sometimes uh, when writing, like I said, a lot of times it's sort of like free thoughts. Um, and so I just kind of do what comes naturally and then I'll come back and go, you know, that, that sounds like 6-8 or that sounds like 3-4. And, and from my time working with orchestras and understanding how maybe a, a schooled musician would look at this, um, it's like, you know, I got to make this so that someone can interpret this. And oftentimes when you're working with studio musicians, they're really good. There's a reason why they're there. And because of that, you'll often get that amazing performance the first, sometimes the second time after that, you kind of, it kind of loses its fire. And so anything that I can do by manipulating the technology, uh, like making sure it's in 4-4, four, four, the key signature is correct, and that the rhythms are correct, um, but in this instance, I just happened to, I happened to do it okay. <laughs> so I know I don't give myself any credit for my keyboard playing, but in this, in this instance, I did okay. Yeah. Have you worked with FL Studio or Ableton? Yes. Uh, what was the first one? Oh, FL Studio? Yeah. I've never worked with FL Studio, but I'm very familiar with it. And I work with Ableton all the time. I teach Ableton. And so I've been using Ableton for 20 years. And uh, it's an amazing uh, a DAW. And uh, it's one of my favorites. How do you, um, and then also, uh, I assume you know Pro Tools? Yes. Um, would you say Pro Tools is distinctly for mixing and, uh, and work like the finalizing touches of a song or whatnot? I think what I've found, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, go ahead. No, yeah, I was just wondering if you, uh, what would you say Pro Tools is for this kind of stuff exclusively? What I've found is working with different producers, different composers, different artists, is that everyone's kind of got their, their thing that they like to do. Um, I started with Pro Tools from version 1.0 when it came out in 1991. Uh, and, and I've been using it ever since. And it started out as an audio editing and mixing program. And so a lot of people kind of think of it like that. 
It does MIDI, uh, everything that I did here in Logic Pro, you can do in Pro Tools with MIDI and, and whatnot and virtual instruments. Uh, but a lot of people think of it more towards mixing and stuff. Um, I use Logic Pro a lot, and I remember one day I, I was thinking exactly the way you were just saying, is that, you know, I, I think I use Pro Tools a lot for mixing and editing. It's like, I should be able to do that in Logic. And so I was like, you know what, I'm gonna take a few hours and I'm gonna find all my tricks, all my things that I go to, all my jokes that you would say, that I do in Pro Tools, and I'm gonna figure out how to do that in Logic Pro. And it didn't take a couple hours, it took like 30, 40 minutes. And I was like, wow, okay, I can do everything that I do in Pro Tools, I can do in Logic. And then I thought, well, I'm also a Pro Tools user, I'm a certified user. Um, and it's like, I should be able to do what I do in Logic in Pro Tools. It would, maybe that would help me better academically. And so I found that I could. And then I got this great sense of accomplishment, right? <laughs> and then I started working with this artist. And it was interesting to watch them work. Because he was like, all right, we're going to make this beat. We're doing this in Ableton. Okay. So I watched this artist put together this really cool beat in Ableton. He goes, cool, we're done. Let's build the track. Export it. Let's put it into Logic Pro. Okay, great, cool. And now the next thing you know, we're developing the whole track and recording vocals and all that. It's like, great, let's mix it. Now we're going to Pro Tools. And I was like, is that the way you work? And he, and he was like, yeah, that's the way I, I'm most comfortable. And I was like, well, right on. And so I just thought it was really cool that there's so many different DAWs out there. And it's neat that some people really go from DAW to DAW to DAW for like different things. I thought that was fascinating. Um, and so, but I was really fascinated with wondering if it could all be done under one hood. And I realized that it could. And so that, that was kind of interesting. Sorry, that's probably a very long-winded response to your very short question. <laughs> no, I, I, um, I use it for myself. And I've been thinking about when I get a bit more of a workflow, I'm going to start using Yeah, and you might find uh, uh, as you, you know, when you take a deeper dive into Pro Tools, is that with what you know in Ableton, you're going to find that Pro Tools does the same, a lot of the same things. It's just the terminology and sometimes the procedure is a little bit different. But I think once you get your head around it, you'll go, oh, okay, these guys are doing pretty much the same, sim a similar thing. The thing about Pro Tools is it's so thorough and it's so detail orientated. Excuse me, you can see why maybe the industry has really embraced it because it's great for dialogue editorial or for editing sound effects or for capturing Foley or for capturing an orchestra, especially when you're working in surround environments like 5.1 or Dolby Atmos. It's really amazing. Um, and I think that at some point Logic will get there too and Ableton will get there as well. Um, and Ableton's a really cool company. They're here. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Their main offices are in Pasadena, and they're really nice people. They have all kinds of things going on there all the time. So. I thought it was Germany. Their main office is in Germany, but the, their North American office is in Pasadena, right on Colorado. Great. Yeah, it's cool. Yes? You said you teach Ableton. Where do you teach Ableton? Uh, I teach at uh, the Los Angeles College of Music. Uh, as well as, uh, I used to teach Ber uh, Ableton at Berkeley, but they turned it into a, oh, I, I forget the acronym, but a massive online course, like a MO, I, f I forget the acronym. And so, uh, but yeah, I've been using Ableton. Uh, we started using it on ER. And uh, the thing about Ableton, and it's something that they're just redoing right now, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna get technical right here, so let me geek out for just a second. Um, when we were working on ER, it was mainly we were working with Cubase, which is another DAW that's still around today. And this guy came over to our studio and said, you got to check out this thing called Ableton. It's the neatest thing, and your whole score is going to change. It's like, okay. It's, you know, and so in about 20 minutes, he showed us Ableton. And we're like, wow, that's really cool. Uh, but we use Cubase. That's how we do the show. And he goes, oh, you can use this thing called Rewire, where you can host 
uh, you know, Ableton and run it with Cubase as your host at the same time. And we were like, yes. And so literally the score for the show changed at that moment. And we, we loved it. And, we, we'd been used, and I've been an Ableton person ever since. Yeah. Cool. Yes, in the back. I had a question regarding uh, composing for a live studio orchestra or ensemble. And my question was about if, if you've ever composed for the studio ensemble, were there any instances where like the musicians didn't like approve of uh, certain like, notes or like some chords that didn't spell correctly? And were there instances where you would you have to like re uh, compose some chords? As a producer, I've seen that happen where, and this is kind of a, an interesting thing, and this happened earlier on with MIDI and virtual instruments where you would get this cello sound, but it would be like the whole 88 key range of the piano. And if you play the cello, you know that the cello only goes down so far and only goes up so far. And so a composer brought in a piece of music for the orchestra and the cellist tapped on his music stand, come here please. It's like, this note is not on my instrument. And I was like, whoa, this guy's getting a little egg on his face in front of these other 80 musicians. And I, from that experience, whenever I wrote for uh, you know, live musicians, I made sure you know, that I didn't make that mistake um, because I kind of felt sorry for the guy because I've been in those situations like, all right, I know that note's not on the instrument, but on this virtual sound, it's pretty cool when I go way down here, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and maybe this isn't for the cello. Maybe this is just a standalone synth part. And so, um, but they, they will tell you, you know, if you do stuff like that, or like when you're writing for strings, the bowing, you know, and they'll say, you know, the bowing here, it, it could be done a little bit better if I did it like this. And whenever that happens, I always default to the, to the player. You know, uh, and again, I, I learned early on that anything I could do to the, the part so that when they walked into the studio, I could put the part in front of them and they're like, okay, they grabbed their oboe, their English horn or their cello or whatever. And then it was like, you guys ready? Yep. Okay. I'm going to count you in. And then you just recorded everything and they usually got it in the first take. And sometimes there was a second take, but rarely that. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Cool. These are good questions, thanks. Yes? Um, you mentioned storytelling through the music, but I'm just curious how you kind of just, I guess, just start out. Like, you know, you watch the scene and then you're like, oh, this sounds like you just kind of fiddle around until you find something that sounds nice, or do you have like a plan in your head of how like, you want it to be in terms of like composing? Or I don't know if that makes sense. But. That's a really good question, and it does make sense. Um, in the, in the post-production process, when a, the director hires the composer, uh, they will sit down and have what's called a spotting session. And in that spotting session, you will watch the TV show or the film from start to finish, and you will stop every time the director feels this scene needs music. And this scene needs music to start at this point, and it's gonna go to this point, and I really want it to do this. But when we get to that one point when he looks the other way and that girl comes in, I want the mood to shift a little bit. And so you have that direction. Those are called the spotting notes. And so all that stuff would be written down. And then you'd know, okay, that's the first cue in act one. Okay, this is what I'm going to do. And then every music cue would have a spotting note that would say exactly what it does. Sometimes these can get a little vague. And not to stereotype directors, but to totally stereotype directors. <laughs> um, my favorite instance of this is when I was doing a spotting session and the director said, this scene, Mark, is, it's, really, it's a really moody scene. It's really dark, moody. But it's not black. It's like purple. And that was it. That's all they, and I was like, what am I supposed to do with that, right? So, and, and usually as a composer, you're usually charged with having to write a lot of music in a very short amount of time. So the last thing you want to do is write and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. So I had to continue the conversation and, you know, demo, d democratically, you know, and sort of 
And anyway, and so I asked him, do you have any temp music? Because oftentimes the director and the picture editor will put in temporary music as they're cutting the rough cut, you know, before they even hire a composer. And I go, oh, yeah, 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 we, we, we did a temp track, didn't we? But what was in the temp track? They played it for me. It was like this cue from Shawshank Redemption. And I was like, oh, oh, now I know exactly what dark, moody, purple is. So I don't have to, because what I was thinking was totally different from what he played for me. So oftentimes, along with spotting notes, the, a music editor will put together a temp track. And the temp track will be music from different areas. And they don't have to worry about licensing it, because they're just playing around with it. They're just trying to figure out what's going to work. Um, and they use this as a reference. And so it was nice to know that they had done that. So when, you know, and I, I understand, you know, directors, they go to film school, they're looking to story, uh, stereo, uh, excuse me, storytell in, you know, film, and their music vocabulary may not be vast, and that's fine. Um, so when I start to sense that, or when anyone starts to sense that, they try to go and, and continue the conversation. Um, and sometimes it can get, you know, uh, e you know, even more vague. I, a, a good friend of mine, uh, this girl, she's a great composer, and the director said to her, "Yes, in this scene, I want you to write a samba." She's like, "Cool, I know what a samba is. Great." So she went home. She wrote a samba. She went to play it back for the director, and he was like, "What's this?" And she said, "Well, what do you think this is?" He goes, "Well, I wanted you to write a samba," and she was like. Okay, <laughs> what did you really have in mind? And he said, you know, a samba, like Paul Simon, you know, uh, the album Rhythm of the Saints. Now, if you're familiar with Paul Simon, the artist, and you're familiar with that album, that actually is all South African musicians. It's not a samba. And so, but this director associated that artist and that album with what they thought in their head was a samba. And so it didn't matter. Now she had to go back and rewrite that cue, but now she knew exactly what to do. But that's just how it is sometimes. You know, that's just part of it. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sure. Wow, these are great questions. I'm glad you guys are asking this. Uh, any others? <laughs> yes, of course. I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem at all. Um, you've done so many different things in terms of, as you said, Foley and composition and post and pre production stuff. I'm curious to know um, how much those roles intersect or intertwine on a single production, like if you're ever uh, working as the composer, uh, if there are a lot of instances where you directly have to do more of the sound design or the Foley work, uh, or if they don't really cross over at all. Sometimes they do cross over. That's a, a really good question. Um, for example, what, one of the things and why I wanted to talk to you a little bit about dialogue, music, and sound effects is so we kind of understand the grand scheme of what's going on in post-production. And oftentimes those three camps are all working simultaneously but independently, right? And so uh, an example of this would be, say if I'm working on this horror film, all right, and there's this scene where this poor girl is being chased through the cornfield by the villain who's got a machete, right? And so I'm writing this, you know, tension, high-paced music. Yum, dun, 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 dun. She's getting chased. He's getting closer. It's getting tense. It's getting tense. He finally grabs her and he brings up his machete and she's about to get offed, right? And I'm thinking, wait, should I hit that with, pardon the pun, a taiko drum? We, were, we talked, we joked about this earlier. And I thought, wait, hold on a second. Maybe I'll call sound effects, because we're on this together. So I would reach out to the sound designer and say, hey, in that scene, I've got this whole thing going on musically. When he gets her, you know, do you have sound for that? Is that your moment, or is that my moment? And he goes, really, it's our moment. He goes, I'll tell you, we did something really crazy with watermelons and machetes, and you're going to love what we have there, so please don't step on it. And I was like, oh, cool, no problem. Thanks for the talk. And so I went back and I had this big thing and then I shoot and then I just let it be there for the sound to just punctuate it. So even though we're all working simultaneously and independently, we do have the ability to communicate with each other. And when I sense something is happening in sound effects or maybe even in dialogue, then I would reach out to those department heads, the, the dialogue editor or the sound effects editor, and just sort of ask their, their opinion. 
Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Uh, you know, I, I feel the more you know about post-production, and in this case, because I really gravitated towards music early on, but because I was aware of dialogue, editorial, and uh, sound effects and Foley, it just helped me to understand my role even more. Especially music, like around dialogue. You don't write around dialogue. I mean, you do, but you literally write underneath it or above it. You treat, a lot of people, John Williams is really good at this, he'll treat the dialogue as almost the solo instrument. And so that will all be in that frequency range and then they'll write their stuff above it and below it so that it doesn't get in the way. Um, and so I, I think that, that helps out helps out considerably. Cool, good question. Other questions? Well, thank you for your time. It was nice to be here today. And, uh, hope you have a great afternoon. Enjoy the sun before the next storm comes. Thanks again. Thank you.